I expect you've seen a film where a particular character says something in the wrong way to the big boss and then suddenly there's that feeling in the room where does he know who he's talking to? Uh oh! And it's the kind of ground swallow me up moment. Don't you know who you're talking to? And this is all about speaking to God. Speaking to God. And who's speaking to God on your behalf? Throughout the Bible, it's emphasised that God is holy, that God is perfect and pure and set apart from sin and us. He's different. He is perfect. And even more, far more than needing to speak to the big boss with the right words at the right time in the right way, we need to approach talking to Almighty God in the right way. And firstly, we can't do it ourselves. We can't do it ourselves. And that might seem as a, a bit of a letdown or a bit of a curious thing. Well, if we can't do it ourselves, what are we doing here? Surely we just pack up and go home and live life for the how many years we have on earth and not think about God. But that's only one side of the coin. That's only part of the story. We can't do it ourselves, but we need a go-between. We need a go-between. So this message is all about who's speaking to God on your behalf. Well, the Israelites' first priest was Aaron. Aaron. Who was Aaron? Moses' brother, wasn't he? And Moses said, who am I to go to speak to the people of Israel? And he was first called. Aaron was the first high priest. He was the tribe of Levi. And of course, we've got the book of Leviticus in our Bibles, full of different instructions of how they were to dress, how they were to worship. Lots of different instructions. And the first century readers of this letter of Hebrews, Jews who became Christians, but they could still see those Jewish rituals, if you like, those sacrifices being made. As they went to Jerusalem, they could still see the same temple, Herod's temple, being used. They could still see those sacrifices, in spite of the fact that Jesus had gone to the cross. Jesus had risen again. Jesus had ascended, but they were still confronted, still had those Jews, those Orthodox Jews, in their presence, doing all those ancient practices. They could still see Jewish worship all around them. And they must have been thinking, again, this whole question, who's speaking to God? on your behalf because they've got the old system going on at the same time as perhaps their leaders were talking to them in the same way that I'm doing to you now and their leaders say look to Jesus look to Jesus but then around them in a week would be people busying around going the old way about things Who's speaking to God on your behalf? Well, verse 14 of chapter 4 says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who's gone through the heavens. He's called a great high priest. Now, high priests were rare enough, never mind priests, but he is the only great high priest. He's the greatest person. He's superior to anyone else. In all history because he was both son of God and son of man he was the greatest man and of course he is still God fully God and fully man so it says therefore since we have a great high priest who's gone through the heavens 
and then was returned after his work on the cross and his resurrection Jesus the Son of God let us hold firmly to the faith we pr profess hold firmly to the faith and that's that's really important isn't it it's just banded about often in our culture to keep the faith it's like a, a thing we throw out sometimes when we when we leave someone instead of goodbye or yeah. keep the faith but this isn't flippant hold firmly to the faith the faith that we profess that's really really quite key why it tells you in verse 15 for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are yet was without sin let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence what's the throne of grace you might ask well we talked earlier about a big boss didn't we this is far greater this is god in his very throne room this is god in his place and yet we can come to that place and you notice it says the throne of grace now what's grace two terms that we we need to think of here there's mercy and there's grace now mercy is not getting what you do deserve so if you deserve punishment and it's withheld I don't don't punish you you're not punished I'm not punished that means that's mercy but grace is giving you something good that you don't deserve and so if it's the throne of grace it's obviously being something good it's something good that we don't deserve finding grace to help us now in the Old Testament the Old Covenant it was just a covering over sin it was just to cover sin but now the new covenant it says that our sins are cleansed not simply covered but cleansed that they're done away with so we need to find grace we find grace there at the throne of grace find grace to help us in our time of need our time of need is always because we've always done something wrong haven't we we continually don't do the will of God and so we must continually come to him for that for that grace every high priest is selected from among men selected because they're just human Every, every priest is just a human being selected from among men and appointed to represent them in matters relating to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins so there's a job description if you like yeah? it tells them what he is to do to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins he is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and going astray since he himself is subject to weakness he is just human it doesn't matter how good the priest is he has made mistakes before God he has sinned the priest has need of a saviour too think again keep thinking about the Hebrews who first heard these words and had them read out to them and would read them themselves and thinking of that question when they're being thrown out that question who's speaking to God on your behalf is this priest adequate is a priest like Aaron or any of the other priests are they are they adequate compare Jesus look how different he is to the priest who offers sacrifice so it says he 
This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as for the sins of the people. Because he himself is a sinner. And so he has to offer sacrifice for himself before he offers sacrifices for the people. No one takes this honour upon himself. He must be called by God, just as Aaron was. Called by God. So no one, no man could appoint himself as a priest. He had to be the right person in the right place, doing the right things the right way. And there are some vivid illustrations of where people went wrong and didn't do right in the Bible. Think of King Saul. He tried to do it. It was the time where Samuel, the prophet, said he would return after seven days. And in the evening of the last day, Saul gave up. King Saul gave up and thought, it's too, it's too long. I've been waiting too long. I, I had the seven days. My enemies are still there. I'm still getting really restless and nervous about it. And Samuel hadn't turned up. And so King Saul, even though he was a king, only the king, he acted as if he were a priest and he offered sacrifices. And guess what? As soon as he had finished doing that, Samuel the prophet turned up. He hadn't been late. Yes, he'd stretched his faith until right the way through the end of the seventh day. But he then told him that he would lose the kingdom because of his disobedience. Korah, in the time of Moses, led a rebellion with 250 others set themselves up as priests. Do you know what the result of that was? It was a tragic judgment. It says there was a, an earthquake. The, 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 the earth split open. And these men disappeared into it. We don't mess with God. This is really, really important, isn't it? You don't set yourself up as a priest just because you want to. So you have to be called. You have to be called. And you can see that even Jesus was called to his work as a priest. This is what he says in verse 5. So Christ also did not take upon himself the glory of becoming a high priest. But God said to him, he quotes now from Psalm 2. You are my son, today I have become your father. And that takes particular relevance after the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. It was fulfilled when Jesus was risen from the dead. In another place he says you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Now we're going to be looking at Melchizedek in a couple of weeks time. A really fascinating character. He's mentioned twice actually in today's reading. But if you could just park any thoughts uh, about him and any curiosity for another time. But that is still really important that it says you're a priest forever. You're a priest forever. Why? Because these priests, just like you and me, had a, a lifespan of how many years? 60, 70, 80 years. And then they died. Jesus is so different because, as we see both there in verse 6, your priest forever, and in verse 9, he became the source of eternal salvation. It's all about an eternal priest, an eternal priesthood here. And so it says in verse 7, during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. He was heard because of his reverent submission. He was saved from the captivity of death. Now, perhaps I'm not a particularly passionate preacher or a passionate person, 
But Jesus was a very passionate person. And we can see that here. It talks about his loud cries and tears for the one who could save him from death. Obviously, he wasn't saved from death <laughs> because the whole point of him coming was to save us from eternal death. But Jesus was full of passion for us. We talk about the passion, that, that, that season of Easter from uh, the uh, Palm Sunday onwards in that week. We talk about the Passion Week. And it's Jesus' passion for us and for Christians the world over, Christians throughout history, that he should save us, his people, for himself, redeemed, bought by his own blood. The passion of Jesus, the love of Jesus for us. Earnestness for people's souls, and I believe that's a, that's a model um, to, to, to myself as a pastor and to, and to, other, to other leaders as well but we are saved from the captivity of death and its power because Jesus gave up his life Jesus he's both the great high priest and he is our sacrifice and he's got some interesting words here as well that you might be curious about because it says in verse 8, although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered and once made perfect. And you might think, perfect? Made perfect? I thought he was perfect already. You've just told me he was God. He is God. That word perfect, think of that in terms of completeness, being made complete. He was already complete and perfect as God. But when he became human, he had to experience all that we go through. And he fulfilled perfectly. He did not disobey. He did not break any part of the law. He was perfect. The perfect human as well as the perfect God. And there it says, although he was a son. Although he was a son. In other words, he was already the inheritor. He was already the heir. He would have received all this anyway, automatically the heir, the inheritor of all things. He nevertheless practiced obedience. He submitted himself to the Father's will. Again, a wonderful example to us. It's always great to have good examples around us, isn't it, of a Christian or you know, we say, oh, that's, that's the person we can look up to. But even the greatest person must look up to Jesus because Jesus is greater than the greatest person who's only human. Some of you might know the old Carol King song, uh, You've Got a Friend. <coughs> Winter, spring, summer or fall. All you've got to do is call. And you've got a friend. Well, that's a nice thought. But of course that friend, Carol King or whoever it will be, won't always be around for you. They're not eternal, are they? They're not eternal. Many of us here have lost loved ones. And as much as you pledge your friendship and your love to people, we will not always be around. The wonderful thing is Jesus is the eternal saviour. He is always able to be with us. Great, great words there. He became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. So we've got to obey him. What's his call? His call is to follow me, he says. Follow me, take up your cross, deny yourself. We must obey him. Go through into his salvation. He was designated by God to be the high priest, to be high priest, in the order of Melchizedek. And just, I know I said in a couple of weeks' time we were talking about Melchizedek. The interesting thing is, as well, as at uh, the outset of that, is, of course, Melchizedek um, is a different order 
it's not in the order of Levi, and it's actually to do with a different order to the him. That's that's something else again, but that's what Jesus was. Yeah, saying he's in the order of Melchizedek rather than being in the order of Levi. So Jesus Christ, not just the eternal friend, but the eternal priest. No more sacrifices. One death, once for all. That's a relief, isn't it? Again, think back those those first readers of this chapter, of this book of Hebrews. They'd be seeing those sacrifices before them from those people who they came out from, those Jews. And challenged by that question, who's speaking to God on your behalf? In this priest, this priest who's only here for a few years, no, they're, they're doing something that's incomplete. It was just a foreshadow of what we've got now. We've got the reality of Jesus with us by his powerful Holy Spirit. He's gone into the heavens. He's gone ahead. He's preparing a place for you. He's done it all. It's complete. The work is complete. Now, aside from that, I don't think anybody here is Jewish. <laughs> I don't think we've seen... Um, anything like the temple and any of those sacrifices in our lifetime. But I can still challenge you, who's speaking to God on your behalf? Who's speaking? Because you cannot stand in your own stead. You will not be able to stand at the end of your life on Judgment Day. You cannot just say, like some people I've spoken with, they'll say, oh, I'm going to give God a piece of my mind when I see him. And I think, no, you're not. You won't be able to speak. Because there's only one who can stand and speak on your behalf. And that is the Lord Jesus. And so I urge you, trust in him. He is the one. He is the sin bearer, the saviour. Hold firmly to the faith. Find grace to help us. The one who brings salvation to all who obey him. Pray that you might find real value in that message today. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, we know that we pray in Jesus' name because he is the one who's gone before. He's the one who's died on the cross in our place. He is the one who is sat at your right hand in heaven. And he is the one who is the eternal, perfect high priest, the great high priest in the order of Melchizedek. We praise you, Lord, for the completeness of our salvation. May we not be trusting in anything else. May we always be speaking to you, knowing that Jesus is there pleading our cause on our behalf. Lord God, please unite us around your good, solid, wonderful, eternal Bible truths. May we be excited about your word tonight to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.